Olga of Kiev, also known as Saint Olga, a powerful leader and regent of Kievan Rus from 945 to 962 AD. She gained renown for her astuteness and merciless revenge against the Drevlian tribe, who were responsible for the death of her husband Igor. Her actions established her as a prominent character in the early history of Eastern Europe, and among her most renowned acts of revenge were the slaughter of the Drevlian envoys and the complete annihilation of an entire urban centre through a cunning strategy employing birds transporting incendiary substances back to their roosts. But in addition to her military activities, Olga is also renowned for her contribution to establishing the administrative frameworks of the given state. She introduced systems of tribal tribute and established legal sanctuaries, thus providing the state with a proper structure to build upon. But of course, her most enduring significance was her adoption of Christianity in the year 957, establishing her as the inaugural monarch of Kievan Rus to embrace the Christian faith, possibly due to the influence of the customs of the Byzantines. Her conversion was essential in the process of Christianizing Russia, paving the way for her grandson, Vladimir the Great, to officially embrace Christianity. She was officially recognized as a saint in the Eastern Orthodox Church due to her endeavors to propagate the Christian religion across Eastern Europe, and to this day she is still widely venerated. Hello and welcome to the channel. Nice to meet you, newcomers. Good to have you back with me, those returning. A much requested video today. Everyone keeps asking, when are you doing Olga of Kiev? When are you doing Olga of Kiev? Well, today I'm doing it. As always, supporting the channel is easy. Just enjoy yourself while you're here. But I've also set up a Facebook if you want to search me up on there. Give me a like and follow and like and subscribe. You know, all the normal stuff that tells YouTube to push the video out more. Now, let's all get nice and relaxed now that that's out of the way. We can learn all about Olga of Kiev. And not just the revenge attack that you're all obviously here for. Of course, we're going to talk about that in great detail. But there is so much more that she's done. So strap yourself in. Let's do it. So when exactly was Olga born? Well, unfortunately, we don't quite know. But we look at a range between 890 AD and 925 AD. And according to the primary chronicle of the history of that area, her ancestry may be traced back to the Varangians, who were effectively Vikings. And she was born in Pleskov. There's more information missing about her life prior to her union with Prince Igor I of Kiev and the arrival of their son, Sviatoslav. But based on the analysis of ancient Russian history by Alexei Karpov, it is determined that Olga was a mere 15 years old when she got married, which is pretty normal for the time. Sounds a little odd by our standards, but hey, that's just the way it was. Now as for Igor, he was the successor of Rurik, the progenitor of the great Rurik dynasty, and had quite a lot of power behind him. But you see, following the demise of his father, Igor came under the custody of Oleg, who had solidified his authority in the area by subjugating nearby tribes and building a central city in Kiev. 
But of course, at this time, Kiev and Rus was more of a loose tribal union that encompassed present-day regions of Russia, Ukraine, and Belarus. Now, as with every good story, there's got to be the bad guys. Of course, I say that a little tongue-in-cheek, because it's all depending on who's telling the story. But, in this case, the quote-unquote bad guys are the Drevlians, an adjacent tribe who had a, let's just say, multifaceted relationship with the expanding state of Kievan Rus. The Drevlians had before allied with Kievan Rus in military expeditions against the Byzantines and sent tribute to the predecessors of Igor. But following Oleg's demise, they ceased their tribute payments and redirected their funds to a nearby warlord. Well, in 945, Igor embarked on a journey to the Drevlian capital, Iskorosten, with the intention of compelling the tribe to make payments as a form of tribute to Kievan Rus. Back to normalcy. Well, in the face of Igor's superior military force, the Drevlians yielded and made payment to him. And that's a pretty good tip. If you're ever unsure if someone's going to agree to your terms, bring a couple of hundred of very tough-looking guys with scary-looking swords with them, and that usually helps grease the wheels a little bit. Well, upon their return, Igor and his army were still somewhat dissatisfied with the payment, so they embarked on a new expedition this time with a limited escort, in pursuit of even more tribute. But this time, the Drevlians were simply not going to have it. Upon reaching their land, they assassinated Igor. Well, as reported by the Byzantine writer Leo the Deacon, Igor wasn't just, you know, killed quickly. He unfortunately met his demise by brutal acts of torture, during which he was apprehended, bound to tree trunks, and torn apart. Well, it's been proposed that Leo may have fabricated this sensationalized rendition of Igor's murder, drawing inspiration from the old works of Diodorus Sicilus, which we've heard of him, and his description of a comparable manner of execution employed by the bandit Cenus, who resided near the Isthmus of Corinth and was slain by Theseus. Perhaps so. I mean, I'm sure it's not the first time that this method of execution has happened. And if the writer had drawn execution from this method, Perhaps the Drevlians could have also drawn their inspiration from it, too. So personally, I think, hmm, both ways are possible. Well, theories aside, following Igor's demise in 945, rest in peace, by the way, Olga assumed the role of regent in Kievan Rus, to govern on behalf of their son, Sviatoslav. She was the inaugural female ruler of Kievan Rus, as had never happened before. But of course, circumstances were the way they were and could not be changed. Well, there is less information available regarding Olga's time as the ruler of Kiev. However, the primary chronicle does provide a narrative of her rise to power and her violent retaliation against the Drevlians to avenge her husband. Well, it offers some understanding of her role as a leader in the civic affairs of the Kievan people. 
Well, there is one archaeologist too, one Sergei Belitsky, who states that Olga, like with the previous rulers before Vladimir the Great, also used the Bident as her personal emblem. No doubt that one you've seen in the thumbnail, if I've remembered to put it in. You know, the Ukrainian symbol that they're always using. I'm sure the entire world is familiar with that by now. Well, following Igor's demise at the hands of the Drevlians, Olga was in control. You see, Sviatoslav was only three years old at the time, and generally three-year-olds do not make very prudent decisions in government. It's best to wait until they grow up a little bit. That being said, the older people don't seem to do much better. Well, after successfully ambushing and killing the king, the Drevlians dispatched a messenger to Olga. And get this, they had the cheek, the gall even, to suggest that she immediately marry Prince Mal, who was the one who killed her husband. Can you believe the absolute rudeness of them? Well, well, a group of twenty Drevlian negotiators travelled by boat to Kiev in order to deliver the king's message and assure the obedience of Olga. Perhaps they were underestimating her. Certainly seems that way. Either way, when they reached her court, they informed the queen of their purpose in Kiev to convey the news of their husband's demise and invite Olga to marry their Prince Mal. But Olga replied, as we do have the text from the primary chronicle that states her saying, Your proposal is pleasing to me indeed. My husband cannot rise again from the dead. But I desire to honour you tomorrow in the presence of my people. Return now to your boat, and remain there with an aspect of arrogance. I shall send for you tomorrow, and you shall say, We will not ride on horses nor go on foot. Carry us in our boat, and you shall be carried in your boat. Well, upon the Drevlian's arrival the following day, they positioned themselves outside Olga's court, nice and excited in anticipation of receiving the promised honour. No doubt big smiles on their faces. Well, upon reciting the exact phrases instructed by her, the inhabitants of Kiev revolted, transporting the Drevlians in their vessel. The ambassadors perceived this as a significant accolade, akin to being transported in a palanquin. The individuals were escorted to the coat, court rather, and thereafter lowered into a pre-dug trench, as per Olga's instructions, where the diplomats met their deaths by being buried alive. According to the primary chronicle, Olga stooped down to observe them being buried and asked them if they felt the honour to be satisfactory. It's a cold woman. Subsequently, Olga conveyed a note to the Drevlians, had to tell them the good news, of course, urging them to dispatch their esteemed individuals to her in Kiev with the purpose of facilitating her visit to their prince in a manner befitting her status. Unaware of the outcome of the initial diplomatic mission, the Drevlians assembled a second group of individuals to send, specifically those who were considered the most skilled rulers of the Dreva region. Well, upon their arrival, Olga had a little bit of a surprise for them, she issued a directive to her entourage to prepare a bath for the men, 
and thereafter summoned them to present themselves before her, once they had completed their bathing and making themselves look as nice as possible. Well, upon the Drevlian's entrance into the bathhouse, Olga locked it shut and deliberately set it on fire, starting from the doorways, resulting in the incineration and subsequent death of all of the Drevlians in there. It's too hot in here. <laughs> That's not cool. You can't joke about that. Well, Olga dispatched a subsequent communication to the Drevlians, instructing them to arrange copious amounts of mead in the location where you murdered my husband, so that I may lament at his burial site and host a commemorative banquet in his honour. Upon reaching Igor's tomb, Olga, accompanied by a small retinue, displayed a genuine sorrow and organised a commemorative banquet. The Drevlians joined them and commenced consuming alcohol excessively. All part of the plan. You see, when the Drevlians were well and truly intoxicated, she commanded her supporters to go ahead and begin the night's work, execute them all, and personally encourage her entourage to engage in the slaughter of the Drevlians themselves. As stated in the primary chronicle, a total of five thousand Drevlians perished that particular night. However, Olga, upon her return to Kiev, made arrangements to assemble an army with the intention of eliminating any remaining survivors. Not a single Drevlian was going to get away. Bad day to be a Drevlian, I see. Well, the initial confrontation between the military forces of the two nations proved highly favourable for the armies of Kiev and Rus, as they emerged victorious in the battle with ease and compelled the remaining soldiers to retreat into their respective towns. Subsequently, Olga proceeded to Iskorosten, which is now just known as Korosten, the very location where her husband had been killed, and initiated a military blockade of the city. But after a year of unsuccessful siege, people were getting a little bit hungry. So, what did Olga do? She came up with a rather interesting idea. She transmitted a message to them, inquiring what exactly their reason was for their continued refusal to comply. She also went on to say, Every single one of your cities has capitulated to my forces and agreed to pay tribute, resulting in the residents now peacefully tending to their fields and lands. However, you would prefer to perish from starvation rather than succumbing to the imposition of tribute. Well, the Drevlians, suddenly backed into a corner at this point, expressed their willingness to pay the said tribute, but they expressed concern that she still harboured intentions of seeking revenge for her husband. Olga stated that she considered the murder of the messengers sent to Kiev, along with the incidents that occurred during the, the big party that she held, where she killed five thousand of them to be sufficient reasons for her to, well, put the matter to rest. But subsequently she made a modest plea, requesting, Kindly provide me with three pigeons and three sparrows from each dwelling. On the Drevlians seemed to be pleased with the idea of the siege coming to an end and at a little cost. No tribute, just a couple of birds. Sounds good to us. So they complied with her request, not knowing what the real plan was. Subsequently, 
Olga commanded her forces to affix a fragment of sulphur, securely fastened with little fragments of cloth, to every single bird. And as the darkness fell, Olga commanded her warriors to ignite the pieces and set the birds free. The birds went back to their nests in the city, causing the entire town to catch fire. Now, according to the primary chronicle, every single house was destroyed, and the fire could not be put out, since all of the houses caught fire simultaneously. It was completely hopeless. They were done for. While the inhabitants managed to escape the engulfed city, Olga commanded her troops to apprehend them, resulting in the demise of certain individuals and the enslavement of the others, who were then distributed among her loyal supporters. She bequeathed the remainder as a gesture of homage. Well, well that is something, isn't it? Is it true, though? Well, we certainly have it written down in the primary chronicle. We don't have many reasons to question it. Either way, it's a fascinating story. Now, back to Olga. After all this happened, she maintained her position as regent ruler of Kievan Rus with the backing of the military and her subjects, after all, Sviatoslav was still a very young child, not fit for ascending the throne, and, well, Olga had certainly earned the respect of her subjects. She implemented the first documented legal reform in Eastern Europe by altering the method of collecting tribute. She also persistently avoided marriage proposals, protected the city during the Siege of Kiev in 968, and ensured the continuation of her son's reign. Well, following her forceful conquest of the Drevlians, the primary chronicle details Olga's journey through the territory of Dreva, accompanied by her son and followers, where she implemented legislation and imposed tribute. Her trading posts and hunting reserves, in fact, still exist. After all this time, they're still there. Well, as a monarch, Olga founded a lot of these trading posts and levied tribute along the Mista and Luga rivers. She also constructed hunting grounds, boundary posts, additional cities and trading posts throughout the entire empire. Her efforts contributed to the consolidation of state authority by establishing trade centers. These were known as Pogosti, which acted not only as commercial hubs but also administrative centers. This network of Pogosti, as they were called in the native tongue, had a crucial role in uniting the Rus people, ethnically but also culturally. Additionally, her border posts laid the foundation for establishing national boundaries for the realm, and throughout her son's protracted military expeditions, she also assumed the control of Kiev, taking up residence in the fortress of Vishgorod, alongside her grandsons. In the 950s, she journeyed to Constantinople, the capital of the Byzantine Empire, also the Eastern Roman Empire. Depending on what you want to call it, I prefer the Eastern Roman Empire, personally. Well, with the purpose of visiting Emperor Constantine the Seventh, There are three main sources of information regarding this event. Okay? The first is a detailed account of formalities and etiquette, called the Book of Ceremonies, which I'm sure is as toffee-nosed as you could imagine. It was written, or commissioned at least, by the Byzantine Emperor Constantine the Seventh, Porphyrogenotos, in Greek, around the 950s. So, the exact 
time when Olga was visiting. The second source that we have is a brief passage, and quite brief indeed, found in the Synopsis of Histories, written in Greek by the Byzantine historian John Skilitsas, around the 1070s, so not quite contemporary, a little bit after the events. And the third source is a lengthy and actually quite exciting tale found in the Primary Chronicle, back to our original source of the information. Now this chronicle was compiled in Kiev around the 1110s, but we don't quite know who exactly did it. We only know that it was a Rus monk, and it's written in the old church form of Slavonic. Either way, the three sources present conflicting accounts on Olga's motives for travelling to Constantinople, along with the timing of the visit and the events that transpired during her stay, even the manner in which they unfolded. Well, we'll start with the Book of Ceremonies. It focuses on the proper decorum used in the Byzantine imperial court, providing detailed descriptions on the formalities observed throughout the numerous ceremonies, including embassies, receptions, and dinners. The book employs practical examples to effectively demonstrate the, the established convention. Olga's visit serves as an exemplar of how to welcome a Rus princess, or any royal in that manner, depicting her in a quite favourable light. Her retinue comprised of a diverse group of individuals, including delegates from different Rus rulers, as well as forty-three merchants, and a monk who was named Gregory. The Book of Ceremonies actually does not include any reference, however, to baptism or the adoption of the Christian name Helena. Now on to that source from John Skilitzes. It documented a concise account in the eleventh chapter of his Synopsis of Histories, stating that Olga arrived in Constantinople following the death of her husband. After being baptized, she displayed ardent dedication before returning home. But contrary to the Book of Ceremonies, it is believed that Olga was baptized in Constantinople and was known for her religious devotion without engaging in any other activities. Well, what about the Primary Chronicle? Sure, that has something to say. Well, while residing in Constantinople, Olga embraced Christianity with the support of the Emperor and the Patriarch Polyectus. Although the Primary Chronicle does not explicitly reveal Olga's reasons for her visit, or, as a matter of fact, the conversion at all, it does provide extensive information about the process of her conversion, which involved her baptism and instruction in the principles of Christianity. According to the Primary Chronicle, Olga was then given the new name, Helena, during her christening, which was inspired by the ancient saint, Saint rather, Helena, who was the mother of Constantine the Great. However, Jonathan Shepherd, in modern historical sense, suggests that Olga's baptismal name was really derived from the wife of the current emperor, who was also named Helena. While the statement of Olga was deemed worthy to reign with him in his city implies that the emperor had a desire to even marry her. Not sure how the other Helena felt about that. Perhaps she wasn't asked. Well, the chronicle attributes Constantine's desire to marry Olga to her exceptional beauty and wisdom. It is plausible that marrying Olga would have facilitated Constantine's acquisition of control over Rus, 
so perhaps there is a bit of politics at play too. Well, another aspect according to the Chronicle is that Olga requested the Emperor to baptize her, fully aware that his role as her baptismal sponsor would create a spiritual relationship that would prohibit them getting married due to the concept of spiritual incest. I bet you didn't know that was a concept. Well, now you do. Well, while her real desire to convert to Christianity cannot be denied, it's also evident that this request served as a means for her to uphold her political autonomy. Either way, following the baptism, Constantine reiterated his marriage proposal to Olga, who responded by stating that she was unable to marry him due to the prohibition in church law against a goddaughter marrying her godfather. All very complicated, isn't it? Well, it's also been contended that the narrative of the proposal was a literary invention. In fact, the incident may have been exceedingly improbable. Indeed, Constantine had already acquired an empress by the time of her baptism. Furthermore, there is ambiguity regarding the accuracy of the Chronicle's account of the events at Constantinople, and there's also dispute surrounding the specifics of her transition to Christianity. In fact, based on the Church Slavonic records, it is recorded that she underwent baptism in Constantinople in the year 957. However, Byzantine sources suggest that she had already converted to Christianity before her arrival in 957. <sighs> All a little complicated, isn't it? Well, it's also probable that she actually underwent baptism in Kiev around 955, and after a further baptism in Constantinople, adopted that new Christian name of Helen. Now, although Olga was not the initial individual from Bruce to abandon her pagan beliefs, as there were Christians in Igor's court who had already sworn oaths at the St. Elias Church in Kiev for the Rus Byzantine Treaty in 945, well, she was certainly the highest position of power among the Rus people to undergo baptism during her lifetime. So she wasn't the first, but it was certainly a big deal. According to the primary chronicle, Olga obtained the patriarch's approval for her voyage back home, and upon her arrival, she made a rather fruitless effort to convert her son to Christianity. There's a great part from the primary chronicle that talks about this. I'll read it now. Olga dwelt with her son Sviatoslav, and she urged him to be baptized, but he would not listen to her suggestion that when any man wished to be baptized he was not hindered, but only mocked. For to the infidels the Christian faith is foolish. They do not comprehend it, because they walk in darkness and do not see the glory of God. Their hearts are hardened, and they can neither hear with their ears nor see with their eyes, for Solomon has said, The deeds of the unrighteous are far from wisdom, inasmuch as I have called you, and ye hear me not. I sharpened my words, and ye understood not. But ye have set at naught all my counsel, and would have none of my reproach. For they have hated knowledge, and the fear of Jehovah they have not chosen. They would none of my counsel, but despised all my reproof. Despite the resistance of her people to Christianity, Olga built churches in Kiev, Piskov, and elsewhere. End of the account from the Primary Chronicle. Pretty scathing, huh? Well, seems like that the 
Christians there were not too tolerant of the pagans. Now, stories as old as time, I suppose. I suppose no one's tolerant of anybody, really. Well, this paragraph I just read shows, in really no uncertain terms, this animosity towards Christianity in Kiev and Rus throughout the 11th century. But we dare say that it was, well, given back just as good. Now in the Chronicle, Sviatoslav asserts that his adherents would deride him if he were to embrace Christianity. And despite Olga's attempts to persuade her son, she was completely unsuccessful. Well, nevertheless, her son made a commitment to refrain from persecuting those in his kingdom who did choose to convert, so signifying a pivotal moment for the spread of Christianity in the region. Although facing opposition from her subjects, Olga kept setting up the new cathedrals. Well, the diplomatic mission to the Holy Roman Emperor Otto I in 959 is attested by several Latin sources. In the narrative of Regino of Prum, it is stated that the envoys made a request to the emperor to designate a bishop and priests for the nation. The chronicler alleges that the envoys engaged in deceit, remarking that their deception was not revealed until it was all a little too late. According to Thietmar of Merseburg, Adalbert of Magdeburg, who later became the first Archbishop of Magdeburg, was initially sent by Emperor Otto to the Rus as a bishop. However, he was later forced to leave by the pagan friends of Sviatoslav I. We can find this same historical information replicated in records from Hildesheim and Quedlinburg. Now, as per the primary chronicle, Olga had passed away due to illness in 969, shortly after the Pechenegs' attack on the city. Upon Svatoslav's announcement of his intention to relocate his kingdom to the Danube region, Olga, who was in poor health, persuaded him to remain by her side until her very last moments. It was merely three days later that she passed away, causing her family and a significant portion of the Kievan Rus to grieve. Here's an account of it, straight from the primary chronicle. Sviatoslav announced to his mother and the boyars, I do not care to remain in Kiev, but should prefer to live in the Periaslavets on the Danube, since that is the centre of my realm, where all the riches are concentrated, gold, silks, wine and various fruits from Greece, silver and horses from Hungary and Bohemia, and from Rus, furs, wax, honey, and slaves. But Olga made reply, You behold me in my weakness. Why do you desire to depart from me? For she was already in precarious health. She thus remonstrated with him and begged him first to bury her, and then go to wheresoever he would. Three days later, Olga died. Her son wept for her with great mourning, as did likewise her grandsons and all the people. They thus carried her out and buried her in her tomb. Olga had given command not to hold a funeral feast for her, for she had a priest who performed the last rites over the sainted princess. Well, despite his disapproval of his mother's Christianity, Sviatoslav complied with Olga's request for her priest, Gregory, to perform a Christian funeral without customary pagan burial feast. The tomb of Olga was situated in Kiev for a period exceeding 200 years, until it was annihilated 
by the Mongolian Tatar armies led by Batu Khan in the year 1240. The sarcophagus, discovered in 1826 during the excavations of the Church of the Tives under the supervision of architect Nikolai Efimov, was identified as belonging to Olga. It was subsequently relocated to the National Historical Museum thereafter to St. Sophia Cathedral. Well, upon her demise, suddenly appeared that Olga's endeavour was to establish Kievan Rus as a Christian domain, but it had been unsuccessful. However, her efforts to convert people to Christianity were successfully completed by not her son, but her grandson, Vladimir, who publicly embraced Christianity in 988. The primary chronicle emphasizes Olga's sanctity in comparison to the surrounding pagans throughout her lifetime, as well as the importance of her choice to embrace Christianity. Once again, a reading from the Primary Chronicle. Olga was the precursor of the Christian land. Even as the day spring precedes the sun, and as the dawn precedes the day, for she shone like the moon by night, and she was radiant among the infidels like a pearl in the mire, since the people were soiled and not yet purified by their sin by holy baptism. But she herself was cleansed by this sacred purification. She was the first from Rus to enter the kingdom of God, and the sons of Rus thus praise her as their leader, for since her death she has interceded with God on her, their behalf. Well, the exact date of her canonization remains a little uncertain too. However, it likely occurred in 1284, alongside Vladimir during a council convened by Metropolitan Maxim. The following year, Metropolitan Maxim travelled throughout the Russian land, specifically Suzdalia and northeast Russia, where he taught, instructed, administered, and disseminated information about their canonization. This included spreading the news in Novgorod and Piskov. In a 15th century document from northern Russia, it is stated that Vladimir, upon exhuming the body of his grandmother Olga, found it to be incorruptible. That basically means that, well, it had no signs of decay. As a result, he proceeded to place it into a wooden coffin within the Church of the Tithe. In 1547, around six centuries after her demise in 969, the Russian Orthodox Church formally canonized Olga as a saint, granting her the title of Equal to the Apostles. And with that, we end our life of Olga of Kiev, or Saint Olga. I'd like to thank the top tier patrons and supporters that I have. Dark, Carey, Kimberly, Ember, Ben, Britt, Charles, Aaron, James, Jeffrey, Melissa, Scott, Stark Factory, and Wendy. Thank you once again for supporting the channel, keeping us going over here. Hopefully we can get to that 70,000 subscribers soon. That would be nice. Perhaps Olga of Kiev can watch down on us and uh, help us with that one. Well, I hope you've all enjoyed the video and I will see you tomorrow. As always, with lots of love and deep appreciation for every one of you, I'll say good night and see you back here tomorrow.